Hello, I'm Alex McLaren. I'm an actor and I've worked as a communications coach since 2002. Now so much business is being conducted remotely, the ways in which we talk, present, build relationships and connect is changing. In this podcast, I want to explore all those issues and prove to you that no matter who you are, you can talk to anyone. Hello and welcome to You Can Talk to Anyone, the podcast in which we open the bonnet on our communications engine. I'm Alex. And I'm Tom. And this is the first podcast of 2022, um, in which we're going to be looking at some unconscious social signals that sometimes people send out. And we've called this resting bastard face, because this, (laughs) which I I will come to uh, recognize I'm twitching the genders there slightly, um, but this is the way this problem was put to me um, once long ago. Tom, do you know what I'm talking about when I say resting bastard face? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Some people are not particularly aware of the impression they give, not necessarily universally, but to some people, when they're not thinking about what they're doing with their face. (laughs) Yes, indeed. uh, They can send a signal, uh, I don't like you, shut up and leave me alone, uh, (laughs) and so on, none of which in any way reflects what they're actually thinking. Yes, absolutely. And this is a particular problem in certain circumstances. I, I know that the well, the first time this was really launched on me was when I was uh, running a, a session about connecting with customers for a flashy department store. And, and in the lunch break uh, in this uh, program, uh, this young woman came up to me and said, Alex, help me. I have resting bitch face. And we were, I just had to laugh straight away because uh, it, it, she was so direct about the way people were, were referring to the problem. Uh, do you know its origin? Uh, no, I don't think I do. Uh, basically, it was a sketch in 2013. We'll put the link into the show notes um, done by some very funny uh, American comedians. It's a very funny sketch, and I recommend you watch it. Um, but of course, it kind of broke out and went viral, and now everybody's using it. The idea that I might have a face which tells a particular story, which has got absolutely nothing to do with my interior emotional reality. I don't remember. My, my recollection is that the person in question, she wasn't giving off massive auras of uh, I'm grumpy. Um, but I think possibly in a department store context, people felt that she should be flashing a wide smile at anybody walking up and down in the attempt to sell them perfume. Uh, so I can appreciate why taking control of the messages she was sending uh, would have uh, suited her more uh, clearly. And this is something that actors are much more familiar with. Uh, When you're on the stage or in front of a camera, you have to think very clearly about what it is you're doing. And I've I've heard it said this is a rather reductive way of thinking about what's going on, but I think it could be helpful for non-actors. I've heard it said that you can think about the business of acting in two different ways. One is inside out, where Mm. you summon up the feelings that the character is meant to be going through and trust that those will be visible on your face and in your behavior in some way. Or the other is outside in, uh, where you are a sort of facial athlete uh, and you've trained your features to rearrange themselves in order to give a specific impression. As I say, that's a very reductive way of thinking about it. But I think most actors do do both of those things at various Mm. times. Yes, I think you're right. And I think also it's worth noting that for actors, I guess, because it's a professional requirement to be able to successfully imitate particular emotional states, it means that they are maybe less anxious about the the authenticity um, trap, which will often come up when people are thinking about this. I mean, when if, if talking to other people and building authentic connections with, with them means... Uh, finding a space where you can be candid about your feelings and express clearly what you're feeling, then maybe uh, sort of artificially imitating particular kinds of emotional state in order to generate a positive connection can feel somewhat paradoxical. And I can appreciate why many people feel um, anxious about it, um, even if it's a problem. So what advice did you give your young retail assistant who complained of resting bitch face, even though (laughs) you could not see any such antipathy radiating off her features? I think it was the first time I'd really come across the the problem uh, presented in that way. And uh, my main issue was to think about the gender dimension of it. Um, mm. and uh, which we'll come up to uh, in, in due course. Um, I think that moment of instant connection and showing that you're, uh, you're, 
you're available to somebody for an interaction uh, at work is mainly to do with eye contact as much as anything else. And so that's what I was uh, I was addressing particularly. Are you are you offering your eye contact to people um, ra- rather than um, cutting it off or seeming like you're engaged elsewhere? Thinking about I have a problem um, is something that had actually come up for her at work. But I think all of us have our own sort of natural issues. I I have a sort of a, a fear maybe that um, <laughs> my natural style misleads people, uh, other people as well. I I, um, I want there to be fun in the interactions I have with people. And I think I like to laugh and I'm looking for the fun in situations. And I think that sometimes creates in me an anxiety that I seem frivolous to other people. <laughs> um, and I think that everybody, you know, we all have our own natural um, thing that can happen. I think that also sometimes people's, just their physiognomy can tell a particular story. Do you, do you, have you ever come across this? I, I, my partner Zoe and I laugh about the fact that our dog always looks like he has a smile on his face just because of the shape of his jaw. Some dogs don't. Some dogs just look sad. Um, but we, we project onto an animal you know, which doesn't have human emotions, um, particular kind of emotional states. I always, we, we have this joke about, about dolphins. Imagine if you were a depressed dolphin, nobody would believe you um, because dolphins <laughs> have this happy grin on their face. Um, and I think that there's, a, there's an element of that within, within human faces as well, that, uh, that sometimes people can be caught seeming like they're naturally sad, even though they're absolutely not. Some people caught seeming like they're naturally happy and maybe they're not. It's just to do with the, the, the way their, their eyes look within their skull and so forth. Yeah, evolutionary psychologists have long pondered why humans have eyebrows. Mm. Uh, and earlier explanations were things like it kind of it keeps the sweat out of your eyes, none of which seemed particularly convincing. And I think the, the current favoured explanation, if it needs an explanation, some things are just weird and, you know, quirky and contingent. Mm. But if there is an explanation, it is that eyebrows make you more expressive. And yes. humans are social animals, and we look at each other's faces for cues about what someone else is thinking and how they're feeling. And having eyebrows makes you a better communicator of those things. So if your features happen by chance to arrange themselves naturally in a state which sends a very strong signal to someone else, if your the set of your jaw gives you a permanent frown, or you've got very big eyes that sparkle, mm-hmm. then you'll be constantly sending a signal which has nothing to do with your internal emotional states, just like your dog and your dolphin. Yeah, it's true. I, I, I mean, and uh, I mean, I noticed that my my partner Zoe, and she's not a particularly heavy makeup wearer, but uh, she is very fair. She has strawberry blonde red hair, um, and one thing which she very regularly does is she buys these bottles of. Uh, I don't know if I'm talking out of <laughs> to school here. <laughs> She'll never she listen buy- to this. No, no, she never listens to this. She buys um, uh, eyelash and eyebrow dye. Uh, because as an actress, she knows that the the sort of the signalling and the sort of the emotional power of being able to signal clearly with eyes and eyebrows and be seen clearly is really important. So she slight, ever so slightly subtly darkens <laughs> those bits of her face in order to be able to be just just be more, more particular with the way she communicates with them. And do you think that's why, going back to the gender mm-hmm. side of things, we talk much more about resting bitch face than we do resting bastard face because women are supposed to be able to alter their appearance mm-hmm. for the better by the application of makeup, something which is not available <laughs> to the men folk, uh, <laughs> at least not traditionally so. Uh, Deborah always says it's amazing that the, the men uh, let the women have makeup because uh, it's so good. Uh, and yeah. of course, it used to be the case that men did plaster makeup onto their faces, but... Uh, in the West, in the circles that you and I mix in, it's mm. very unusual to see a man wearing a suit, tie, mascara, and lipstick. And a lot of slap, yeah. I, I, although historically, particularly in theatre, in the days of uh, less good lighting, uh, people in showbiz have always painted their yes. faces. And, uh, this is sort of a mass dimension. Yeah, it's, uh, it's striking. Well, I think it's, it is, there is something to do with the expectations we have of women, maybe emotionally, and that what they're supposed to be providing. Um, it's supposed to be open and warm yes, and friendly. Yes, you're supposed they're to be supposed being to be, nice to me. Smile, uh, bitch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, yes. They're supposed to be the, the facilitators, the, mm. the carers, the, the maternal ones. And so if they seem even a uh, scintilla less mm. than that, we think, oh, what's what's going on with you, love? Mm. Well, like, it's funny. I wanted <laughs> it's to dreadful. talk about this. I was going to talk about this later, but I wanted to sort of let's bring it up now. I mean, there is this... 
idea of emotional labor developed by an American psychologist, Ali Hochschild, and uh, that uh, that some kinds of work don't just put demands on your, your, your brain and your body, but also on your emotional system, particularly when you're relating to clients and customers in some way. Um, and so that there's, it's almost like some of your emotional bank account is being used up at work. Uh, I remember once uh, talking to a group of people saying, you know, if you're working with customers all day, you're nice to everybody and you go home and you're you're horrible to your partner. And they all just <laughs> roared with laughter because they all recognized the pattern from their own lives. I think it's slightly filtered out that, that sort of emotional labor. People are using it in a much broader sense, I think, than the sense in which it was originally used. Um, and I think possibly some people who feel emotionally put upon by their connections, the expectation that they have to be smiley and nice and friendly and constantly nodding <laughs> um, and uh, and listening when they also have contributions to make. That, that, that pressure, um, people are using emotional labor to, to think of it in those uh, senses as well, and possibly in more uh, political sense as well, that, uh, that women sometimes feel like they're expected to take on uh, the emotional work of managing sexism within their interactions uh, and uh, take the pressure off the men, which is something they reasonably might resent. So going back to your uh, client in retail, was there part of you that wanted to say, if people are accusing you of having resting bitch face, that's their <laughs> problem, not yours? Yes, there was. A, not a massive bit, because she was bringing it to me as uh, as a problem. Um, and so I'm, I just simply have to assume that it's caused the difficulties and it's been recognized and something that she recognizes herself. I've seen different kinds of service style. Um, I remember, I guess it was in the 90s, you know, going to a, a restaurant once when I just suddenly felt, oh, the people here are sending out different social signals. Okay. Maybe it's because they weren't dressed in exactly the same way. So this isn't to do with a face, it was to do with a, a deliberate strategy on the part of the management that the waiting staff should wear smart but different, their own clothes. There was just something slightly more proprietorial about the way that they could welcome you. They didn't feel like servants in the same way. Um, and I think as a as a client, that feeling was one that suited me better than everybody wearing black ties, black waistcoats, and, uh, and, and a kind of a white apron. Uh, Do you know the so film Office Space? <laughs> no, tell me about it. There's a very funny section in that where Jennifer Aniston's waitress is repeatedly told uh, that she isn't wearing enough pieces of flair. <laughs> <laughs> People in this restaurant are required to accessorize their standard uniform with uh, pins and badges and and so on. And if they don't do this uh, that's funny. to a sufficiently high standard, uh, yeah. then corporate gets upset. Yeah, that's funny. My old flatmate, Reese used to work at TGI Fridays, and that's very much that kind of thing yeah. in which basically everybody has a kind of a uniform to show that they're all part of the branded style. We're all a team. But they also have these kind of, sort of wild, extreme diversions from it to make sure everybody knows, don't worry, we're individuals. You can make friends with us. It'll be, it'll be fun. It's, it's kind of it's a very successful model incidentally, even though it may feel like slightly <laughs> artificial. Yeah, so I did kind of want to rescue her from, the, from the, the burden to a degree, simply because of the nature of the firm that she was working for. Um, but I was also aware that, you know, the, the I mean, so for example, the, the emotional labor dimension came, came up initially in America, where as uh, people who work with, so if you're a waiter in America, a lot of your income comes from tips. So getting that connection right is really important. Um, and uh, uh, and it's a really important part of American – I mean, it's filtered into American social life, I think, and it's something that outsiders recognize that there's this often this uh, – there's much more kind of positivity and immediate connection and dynamism that some uh, sort of uh, sort of tired and uh, uh, somewhat cynical English people suddenly recognize when they go to the U.S. for the first time. They go, oh, God, look, everybody's actually really – they're really determined to be lovely to you. And it's it's a funny kind of interaction, isn't it? Because you're expected mm. to build very, very quickly this very warm, friendly, pally rapport with people you're never going to see again. Yeah. And so you you never accuse somebody you've known for 15 years of having resting bitch or resting bastard face because what you're looking for with somebody that you know very well is something unusual, yes. something which is... Yeah different for them because you know their standard patterns and responses very very well mm -hmm. and so 
what you're having to do as somebody engaging in one of these very transitory interactions is figure out what is the social norm and try and hit the middle of that bell curve, yes. regardless of where you happen to land. Yes, and there's, <laughs> and it's quite interesting in sort of international and multicultural universes, you know, big cities particularly, you see this, um, is that there can be a certain amount of variety. I once made a short film <laughs> long ago about a, a, an Englishman who is trying to, uh, to learn Polish in order to build a connection with the woman <laughs> who runs his local cafe. Um, and uh, it's, it's kind of a touching little, uh, little uh, short film. But about 10 years later, Harry Enfield made a sort of an outrageous and much more scurrilous version of going into a Polish cafe yes. in which the two women who run it are totally merciless with uh, how sort of timid and polite he is. And it seems that there's actually quite a lot of variation about the way we smile. In I think in, uh, in, in Russia, Norway and Poland particularly, there's often a sense if you smile at strangers in, in the street that you're clearly mad. Um, <laughs> so that there's, uh, I mean, obviously these are generalizations, but there is variety there um, just in terms of patterns and people's expectations. And so if you take a, it's the same with northerners getting on the tube in London. So learning what the local pattern is, is obviously going to make a difference. So learning what the expectations are within a particular workplace, um, I think I sh should take some of the pressure off those organizations as well, because there is sometimes a sense that God, in this organization, we have to do this in this bizarre, slightly manically friendly way. Well, often an organization will build a brand on people's expectations of what the people there are like. Okay. And so when you're joining a team like that, um, yes, it's reasonable to ask questions about how effective for everybody the house style is, but it's also worth recognizing sort of why it works. Uh, and uh, and uh, if you have a natural um, affinity with it, then maybe it is a good place for you to stay. And if you don't have a natural affinity with it, maybe you need to be uh, finding a place where the culture is different in these regards and would work better for you, for your own natural style. Um, and also, thinking about it, it would mean that you would connect with those people um, in a way that suits them because they're going to those different organizations with different expectations like me and my slightly more proprietorial restaurant. <laughs> Is there an issue that you've identified with resting Zoom face? One of the issues with Zoom is that we don't have real eye contact. Mm. And not only can you not get that connection with someone else, you can't even be certain that the person who appears to be gazing in your general direction mm. is looking at an image of you at all. Uh, they could very well be looking at their notes, playing Minesweeper, uh, or looking at uh, any other delight that the internet has to offer. Um, yes, there is. Uh, I'd say I was feeling I was talking about this last week with some friends that I haven't seen for a while. Initially, when we all went on to Zoom, I remember thinking, oh, wow, it'll be interesting to see how people adjust to this. And I think that the way that they have adjusted to it is that everybody has massively lowered their expectations. <laughs> <laughs> and so now when we go into a Zoom situation, we are expecting people to look detached and we, we just panic us in the same way. We're expecting them not to be looking out of their screens at us because obviously they're looking at something else and we are hoping and assuming that it's us or, or maybe assuming that it isn't. But either way, we simply don't expect the same kind of thing as we do in person. Uh, and I think that what that also means is that we can easily get over any sort of resting Zoom face by simply bringing some energy. <laughs> um, I, I was Again, I was, the, the person I was speaking to is somebody who works for a big charity and they were saying the difference it makes when somebody comes on a Zoom call and actually brings some energy, makes a joke, looks at you, kind of notices something, like any kind of kind of conscious engagement with the other person instantly raises the game by, well, I wouldn't like to... Uh, <laughs> give you a percentage, but it's really serious. Makes a huge um, difference, and, it, it? and it's amazing how few people bother to do it. So it's basically all about uh, being responsive to the other person, which I think addresses the resting element yes. of the whole resting bastard face um, problem. Yeah, part of it is that we're throwing something out there, hi, can you help me? I'm looking for so-and-so. Uh, and not getting any reaction at all. Mm -hmm. And that often comes from anxiety. If mm -hmm. we're feeling tense or anxious or uncertain, we'll mute our responses in mm -hmm. order to avoid doing the wrong thing. But actually, what someone else is looking for is a reaction of any kind. Mm -hmm. So if you are uncomfortable, as many people are, with this idea of, oh, I have to put on an act, I have to pretend, I have to be a performer, just in order to make someone else happy, 
Don't do any of those things, but just do turn the volume up a tiny bit on your reactivity. Mm. So those feelings are all authentic. You're just letting them express themselves in your face and your body a little bit more than maybe is your natural inclination in that slightly tense situation. I think there's also some interesting stuff here about anxiety and stress, because I think social situations affect people differently. I'm very conscious that um, that there's much more neurodiversity acknowledged these days than when we were first learning (laughs) our stumbling way social skills as teenagers. Some people's recognition about the signals that people send out is learned in a very, very different way, much more consciously. I got a best friend of mine from way back. She was got a very late diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. And, uh, and she had to learn uh, the rules of eye contact and smiling by reading kind of body language books. You know, she had a whole collection of them and she was drawing in advice about it. Because uh, and, and those books are quite unusual in that most of us learn these things not in a conscious way. We we kind of learn them purely practically. Um, uh, and uh, but but I think there is much more uh, diversity in that uh, in that dimension of learning about social interaction than perhaps was acknowledged when we were younger. I think also I think one really key thing about these uh, involuntary signals is that because they're often nonverbal signals or sort of they're subtle, we are only ever really guessing about what they mean. Okay, and I think that that's really crucial. We have to be humble about that. I think sometimes we panic ourselves by jumping to judgment about what this person's behavior means. And then that can affect in a negative way the interaction that follows it. And I think that uh, we can have much more positive um, outcomes by just taking our time about rushing to judgment and not assuming that something means what it immediately means. Particularly, it doesn't necessarily mean something about us. Yeah. So um, your homework for the week when you're thinking about the resting bastard face problem is that the next time that you're in uh, any kind of heightened situation with new people, so this might be a new work connection or it might be a social event with new people, and if you do get a signal from the person you're engaging with uh, which feels like it's uh, not a positive one, so they might seem bored, they might seem absent or detached, or they might seem sceptical, um, or their smiles might be slightly confusing. Sometimes you come across people who are constantly grinning. <laughs> you need to remember the following. Firstly, it is almost certainly not necessarily about you. Okay, um, the Everybody's managing their own internal translation process all of the time, um, and it doesn't necessarily relate to something about you at all. Um, secondly it may not mean what it seems to mean so you needn't draw negative conclusions immediately don't panic um, uh, if you're getting a signal which is slightly puzzling if it's a puzzle don't rush to solve it Um, because of course you don't necessarily need to understand it straight away um, and not deciding at all may be better for the relationship Um, so take your time stay listening um, and uh, give them more chances um, and gradually, as you get to know a person better, those things uh, may actually turn out to be quite positive dimensions of the way you engage with them. Alex and I deliver training on all of these topics. We do those sometimes in person, if we're allowed to, uh, and over the last 80 months or so, more frequently via Zoom. And we work with clients on things like uh, client services we've been talking about today, uh, presenting with confidence, telling stories, networking, and lots more. If you want to discuss your needs, do send an email to info at the hyphen spontaneity hyphen shop.com or give us a call on 020-7788-4080. And we'd love to hear from you. So did you try today's homework? How did you get on? Is there anything you hope we're going to talk about and we haven't yet? Send me an email or record your thoughts in a voice memo and we might play it on a future show. Until next time, I'm Alex. And I'm Tom. And thank you very much for listening and goodbye. You have been listening to You Can Talk to Anyone with Alex McLaren and Tom Selinsky. The producer for The Spontaneity Shop was Tom Selinsky. You Can Talk to Anyone is distributed exclusively by Acast.